I'll turn it over to the co-chairs. Thanks, Brandy. I will now move into taking attendance. Uh, Scott Batchelor is still on leave. Uh, Prachi Dave. Suzette Dickerson. Colleen Echohawk. Austin Field. Here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Reverend Pat Patricia Hunter. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Tasha Johnson. I think I think I saw you, Tasha. Are you here? You're here. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Esther Lucero. Uh, Asha Mohammed. Officer Mark Mullins. Officer Mark Mullins is here. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Erica Newman. Erica, I think I see you. Is your um, audio working? I think I see you here. Yes, who's here? Okay, great. Um, Dr. Naveen Pinto? Present. Good morning. Hi. Uh, Lena Santian? Present. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Joseph Saya. Don't see Joseph. Um, Catherine Seibel here. Douglas Wagner. I am here. Good morning. Reverend Harriet Walden. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Lajea Washington. Don't see. And I believe that concludes attendance. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, it is now time to review the agenda and approve. Is there anyone who would like, um, oh, sorry, and the minutes. Nope, sorry, I'm confusing myself. Um, it's time to review the agenda and approve. Is there anyone who'd like a motion to approve the draft agenda? I move that we accept the draft agenda. Is there a second? I'll I'll second. Thanks, Suzette. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Officer Mullins, you opposed? No. Oh, no, that was I. I okay, thank oppose. you. Oh, okay, thank you. So any, and any abstentions? <clears throat> all right, um, the agenda has been approved. It is now time to review the draft minutes. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion to approve the draft minutes? I move that we accept the minutes as distributed. Thank you, Reverend Hunter. Is there a second? I'll step away from the chair and I will um... Uh, Second the vote. Oh. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? All right. The draft minutes have been approved. And now action items for review. So in the last meeting, um, the commission decided that we'd like to follow up with letters to the OPA and OIG after receiving a response from the ethics office regarding questions on behalf of the CPC into their investigations and investigate the process um, around those, uh, those issues. And the letters have been sent and they were included in your uh, materials for today. And I know this item is later on in, in the review of the letters that we, we've sent from the CPC, but is there anything, any points to make right now or any discussion on, on that action item? All right, hearing nothing, um, we are going to move into public comment. 
So public comment is welcomed by the CPC. Individual speakers will be provided up to two minutes to comment about items on the meeting and agenda. And again, as a reminder, the CPC bylaws limit public comment to items that are only on the agenda. Um, Jesse, could you please start public comment? Yes. Um, so far, all I've seen um, signed up so far is Dr. Howard Gale. Um, Dr. Howard Gale, you can, um, one second, sorry. We want to promote you to a panelist momentarily for just a second, just so that you can talk. Um, Dr. Howard Gell, can you speak? Sure, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Good morning. Over the past few weeks, the community has finally had a chance to witness through the investigative work of journalist Carolyn Vick and through firsthand experience via the first real community engagement meetings hosted by the CPC in many years, the degree of obfuscation and gaslighting that our current police accountability partners, including the federal court monitor, are willing to engage in. The response to these revelation has been slander, as when the court monitor accuses a small minority run local news source of engaging in clickbait, or obfuscation and prevarication as when the CPC claims to be monitoring the OIG whistleblower complaints when those complaints were determined many months ago not to fall under the jurisdiction of the Seattle Ethics and Election Commission. The only monitoring of the situation the CPC was engaged in was, as usual, monitoring how to avoid public embarrassment or accountability. This pattern of hiding from the community was on full display at your last meeting when you egregiously violated the Open Public Meetings Act by voting on two proposals neither publicly discussed nor made available, and when it was revealed at that meeting that staff misinformed the public in order to prevent the public from watching a police practices meeting. The CPC strategy of deflecting and hiding might have worked had it not been for local NPR station KOW and reporter Ashley Hiroko embracing the investigative reporting values found lacking in other news outlets when it comes to police accountability. Yesterday afternoon, KOW published more information on the OIG scandal and Andrew Meyerberg's background as a defender of police abuse and as a lawyer willing to violate legal ethics in that pursuit. It is well past time for CPC commissioners to resign from their role as a protector and fig leaf for a corrupt and failed accountability system. Please rejoin the community to reimagine police accountability based in the community, not in bureaucratic commissions that serve only to protect, protect and perpetuate the current system. Go to seattlestop.org to find out how, seattlestop.org. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me make sure that no one else has signed up. I am not seeing anyone else, so public comments are now closed. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I would love to open up the floor to um, the executive director and commissioners in response to public comment, but I see I, I want to be sure that's okay by legal. If I think I saw Teresa on the phone, is that all right to do? comment is for receiving comments, not for engaging in dialogue. So I don't think that this is the appropriate time unless you wanted to amend the agenda to add an item to discuss this. Okay. Co-chairs. Well, oh yeah, Reverend Walden. I'll step away from the chair and make an amendment to, uh, to the agenda that we uh, uh, amend the agenda to uh, discuss, uh, be able to have some uh, uh, feedback or discuss the, um, the um, how it's uh, Mr. Gale's uh, uh, accusations. Mm -hmm. Is there a second to amend the agenda? This is Alina, I'll second. Okay, all in favor of amending the agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the agenda will be amended to include discussion of public comment, um, which we can do now. Um, would anyone like to start this discussion or have a response to the public comment? In just one second, we're gonna get interrupted here. Zoom um, apparently paused the recording for um, some reason, so just- Recording in now. progress. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Um, yes, um, Catherine, this is Edie. I'd like to um, make a comment. 
um, we need to make sure that we um, amend, make sure that the minutes reflect that we are amending the agenda um, to discuss uh, Dr. Gale's uh, comment. And then I'd also like to add to, um, just to reflect for the record that, you know, our public practices uh, work groups and all of our work groups at the CPC, especially during the time that I've been here and even predates me, has never been open to the public. They have been um, in-house work groups um, that commissioners work on um, in a more um, intimate setting to be able to bring that work back to the full commission. Um, so I wanna make sure that I respond to that and that if we do open them up, um, there have been times where there have been hybrid meetings or special meetings where we've needed to um, gather and collect feedback and input from community members, and we have done that. Also, too, as it pertains to OPMA, we are required to open them up if we meet quorum, meaning there is a certain number of commissioners who are in attendance. So I just wanted to make sure that I responded to that, and not in a way that's defensive, but I just want to make sure that when people are putting out information about the CPC, we have not only an opportunity to respond, but be able to correct things that are incorrect. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Grant. Um, any other commissioners or points for discussion? Well, also, I mean, uh, as it relates to the article and dive, you know, uh, at uh, with Ms. Bick, uh, which is uh, uh, that article. Um, also, I think, uh, what we understand too is that still is an HR issue, and um, and we're not uh, we're not tasked to speak on HR issues. I mean that that's a city issue, and it's not a CPC issue. Uh, and all city uh, employees, past and present, have uh, you know they, they have a right to uh, to to follow things through the process, the due process, without interference from any uh, commissioner uh, or uh, uh, or agency. Other than with HR, and that's a that is a that's their policy, uh, and uh, we would just wanted to clarify that that uh, that is their policy, and that policy predates the Community Police Commission uh, around uh, around uh, employees' issues. Thank you, Reverend Weldon. Anything else from commissioners before we move on to our next agenda item? Okay, seeing none, um, we are now ready for department updates. Uh, is there a representative from city council for an update? Yes, this is Newell Aldrich from uh, Councilor Herbold's office. Thank you, Catherine, for the opportunity to speak to the commission. Uh, the council is currently in its budget deliberations and the meetings that are coming up in the next two weeks are on November 10th, there will be a second public hearing on the budget. Uh, on that day, I believe, uh, Budget Chair Mosqueda will release her balancing package, uh, which incorporates council member amendments into the mayor's proposed budget. That balancing package will be dis presented by the chair and discussed on uh, in the budget committee as well on November 12th. So those are the only two meetings coming up during the next two weeks. There could be additional council amendments and meetings on the 18th and 19th before final passage on the 22nd. Great, thank you so much, Noel. Um, from our next update, is there anyone from the mayor's office to provide an update? Mark, Mark, were you raising your hand? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I have a question about the budget. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, is there anything in the budget coming up that is going to allow for retainment and recruitment of officers for the Seattle Police Department? No, Noel, if you're still with us, did you hear that question? Are you able to speak to Officer Mullen's question? Uh, yes, there, there is a proposal for uh, 1.09 million for hiring incentives. Uh, the mayor has done an executive order on that. So uh, I believe that's something that is being considered currently. I'm not sure if there's gonna be a meeting or if that's just gonna be considered during the budget process. 
one potential amendment is to take uh, is to consider hiring incentives beyond officers. Uh, that was discussed in committee and uh, about, for example, uh, 911 call dispatchers. The mayor's subsequent executive order included 911 dispatchers as well. So it's sort of an amendment to the budget she proposed uh, five weeks ago. So uh, that's an issue that's being discussed uh, in the committee and depends what, uh, what the budget chair comes out with for a package on the 10th. 911 is separate from the police department. So why is that, why is that a, why is that, is that being added in 911 or is that taking away from the police or what's that, what's that mean? Cause they're not a part of the police department anymore. Sure. It's, uh, in reaching out to a number of departments, there are a number of departments with first people who work with the public that are struggling with hiring uh, parks, uh, FAS, I mean, animal control, for example. Uh, some parts of Seattle Public Utilities uh, are struggling with an uh, older workforce and not uh, getting people who are able to come in to provide the services. So. The motion is to provide a broader look at where incentives are needed beyond just officers. The numbers are getting frightening. I, I just would like the, the council to know. And uh, we're losing officers daily to other agencies who are taking advantage of the fact that Officers are in fear of losing their job to officers having other reasons why they are leaving the city. And uh, me as a frontline officer, I see it every day and the roll calls are getting shorter and shorter in terms of officers being there to go out on the street. Just to let them know Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I had uh, a, a different uh, question real quick. Um, thank you, Officer Mullins, though, for, um, for that perspective. I don't wanna change the subject if, um, if there's any more to, to say on that, but I had a question on an unrelated matter. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, appreciate, thank you, Officer Mullins. Um, I was curious, uh, I know that the mayor had proposed um, creating the, the triage one service um, that would uh, have, I think it's a, a model where firefighters and um, mental health workers respond to low acuity uh, mental health calls um, and, and you know, instead of officers. Uh, I was just curious what the um, funding situation is for that um, and if, um, if, if that's moving forward, because I know it was proposed, but I'm just not sure what, um, as far as funding and implementation, what the status is of that. You know, that's uh, not an issue I've been working on. I know it's included in the budget. I know there's been discussions. I think there's a proposed amendment to add an additional unit for uh, Health One, which is similar to that, but it's, it's in the mayor's proposed budget. Uh, and I don't believe there's been any suggestion for not including that. I think there is a budget amendment that would increase funding for those kinds of services. By how much? Uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, I believe it's Councilor Lewis proposed something which uh, is over $10 million. Okay. Yeah, thank you. For sure. yeah, you're welcome. I think it, uh, might be listed if you look at the budget committee meetings under key services. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you, Newell. Um, and I know we were running ahead of schedule earlier, so I want to check back in. Is there a representative from the mayor's office to provide an update? Okay. Uh, from the monitoring team? 
Good morning, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Ron. Uh, I request your forbearance for just a moment, and I would like to pose a question to Newell. Yeah. Okay. N Newell, I apologize, but um, I, I just like a little bit of clarity, and perhaps I misheard you. Uh, I know that the mayor has uh, promulgated an executive order uh, encompassing bonuses of $25,000 for new hires. But what I didn't quite understand from your presentation was whether either the council or the mayor have promulgated any new proposals uh, with regard to funding for the police department, uh, replacement of officers, that sort of thing, other than the mayor's uh, uh, executive order. Uh, are you speaking regarding the hiring budget per se? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, you know, I could uh, share the staff presentation uh, that uh, I believe the city attorney's office has shared with the monitors, monitor team. Uh, and that's that's not necessary. You're a quite articulate guy, and um, I don't want to take up any more time during this meeting than we need to on this point. Is there a, a somewhat concise and succinct answer to my question? I, I see. I, I see that uh, Malik Davis has ha is waving his hand, and I apologize that I, I didn't see your hand raised before. Um, Malik, do you have a response to this question? Yes, good, good, good morning, community. I, I just uh, sent the walk-on amendment that Councilmember Peterson has put forward that would bring forward $2.1 million in retention incentives for the Seattle Police Department. Included in that amendment, it describes what the law department has said about cash incentives. So Ron, I hope that answers your question. Jesse, Felicia, and Brandy received a copy of that amendment. I, I'm not sure how to show that. Um, in this format. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And Ron, do, oh, Officer Mullins, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I heard uh, retainment, uh, but I didn't hear recruitment. Is that involved in that? The last gentleman, the last yeah, gentleman. Mr. Davis. No, no, it is not. But that that's that's a great point that uh, I know that the council member would encourage all of you and all of your networks to to share with the council and the, the <clears> mayor <throat> um, as another option to put out there. But it, it does not include uh, re recruitment. Uh, the, I, I suspect that the mayor's uh, emergency, uh, emergency order is an, um, you know, is a proposal putting forward that gets at recruitment, whereas Councilmember Peterson's has to do with the retention of existing officers. Well, both is, both is important. I just like to put that out there um, because whether right or wrong, officers leaving the city. And I don't always agree with some officers for leaving. I'm not going anywhere because this is my community. But uh, th whether whether they leave for whatever reason, we need to recruit officers, and we're losing officers of color because a lot of the younger officers are 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 going to other agencies. Or leaving police work uh, all all together, and whether those reasons are for whatever they are, the numbers are the most important thing. When I go into that roll call and I don't see anybody in there, or when I go into that roll call and I see two guys in there, that worries me. At thirty-one years, it worries me, and I don't worry about too much, but that does worry me. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you uh, for this discussion. I, I appreciate it. Um, and I also being mindful of time, we have about five minutes left to, to stay on track. Um, so coming back to Ron for, for updates from the monitoring team, do you have any updates to share with us today? Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, since the last meeting of the CPC on October 20th, the monitoring team uh, has engaged in an OIG SER planning uh, council session in order to uh, select the wave three panel members for the significant events review process, which has been ongoing. We also met with Judge Robart uh, in a meeting. We have uh, attended an SPD African American Advisory Council meeting in which the Judkins Park shootings and continued gun violence were prominently featured. Uh, we had one of our usual monitor team meetings and we had a meeting with DOJ. Uh, in the meeting with Judge Robart and uh, in the meeting with DOJ, we extensively discussed uh, community engagement and the upcoming community engagement sessions, which are going to be facilitated by the CPC. That concludes my report on behalf of the monitor team. Thank you so much. Um, do we have a representative from the Department of Justice to provide an update? Yeah, hey everyone, good morning. Uh, I'll be quick, uh, just to sort of echo uh, Ron's comments. We, we've had meetings in the last several weeks and we continue to work on uh, the assessments and the monitoring plan and continue to review um, all those areas. And so that's that's our brief update. Great, thanks Matt. Um, from the Office of Inspector General. Good morning, Director Grant and commissioners. Uh, thanks for letting me give this update. So right now um, in my queue, I've got the draft for the discipline audit that's been ongoing for um, quite some time and getting ready to push it out hopefully in the next few weeks. I also have the draft of the Sentinel Event Review Wave 2 report that will be ready to be published uh, fairly soon, I'm hoping. We will be pushing out our annual report. Um, there was some delay in the annual report and given the delay, we went back and looked at the information and some of it um, needs a little bit of updating just to make sure that it's as current as it can possibly be with new information that's that's been made available to us since uh, in this in this lag time. So we're going to be updating that, getting it out. And uh, we have a report on SPD's crisis response that my office has been working on that we hope to push out by the end of the year. Um, in terms of staffing, we have two new permanent OPA auditor investigator folks and two temporary workers um, that all have now cleared backgrounding and have their equipment so they can get to work uh, helping us clear out the backlog that um, has built up a little bit. And one of those folks is um, has some real expertise in auditing. And so we're also engaging uh, that person to help us with some process improvement. So those are my updates for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inspector Judge, and um, really looking forward to, to that report on crisis response. That sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, anyone from the Office of Police Accountability to provide an update? Hi there, I'm here in place of Andrew while he's out on leave. <clears throat> uh, we don't have any major uh, updates today, except for just a reminder that the uh, revised OPA manual was filed with the court on Friday and uh, it will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Um, besides that, just a reminder that uh, Director Meyerberg will be back on November 15th. Great, thank you so much, Ann. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, uh, oh, M Officer Mullins. Yes, I, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to get in on uh, the um, Inspector General, the judge. Could I ask her a question, please? Yeah. <clears throat> um, the question is traffic stops. What's, a, what's the status on traffic stops and where are we going with that? Thank you for reminding me, Officer Mullins. I appreciate that. So we've been doing a lot of work on traffic stops. And you may remember that I sent the chief a letter back in May uh, asking him to uh, look at his policy for making traffic stops and work with us and other stakeholders to identify offenses that could be either um, be prioritized 
enforced through some other means or you know th that we could limit the circumstances in which officers and community were coming into contact for in-person traffic stops for things that were really about um, financial penalties that were regulations that didn't have a direct impact on pedestrian or motorist safety and so um, we be, OIG began working with the policing project and um, you know sort of establishing a framework for what this might look like we convened a fairly large stakeholder meeting in late summer and since that time we've been working with SDOT and uh, other folks to gather data to kind of look at the state of data in Seattle. And frankly, it, it, it's not great um, in terms of the traffic stop data that SPD has, uh, the, the most of the data that we have that can in any way give us some insight into disparity comes from court records and citations, but that really misses you know, a huge chunk of traffic stops where there was no citation issued. So SPD has, since that time, um, made some changes in their MARC 43 uh, data management system so that that information is now being collected electronically and it will be available to us for analysis. So that's a huge, huge step in the right direction for us. Um, had a lot of conversations in the interim with the chief and he has uh, agreed with us to in the short term identify, you know, a short list like many other cities in the country are beginning to do of traffic stops that can you know, either um, be enforced through some other way or stop being a primary means of enforcement. So you know, if you have expired registration or your, your tailpipe is loud or something like that, it, it would perhaps no longer be a primary basis for an officer to stop somebody, but let's say you're stopped for DUI or reckless driving or you know, speeding through a school zone or something that we've identified as a group that is meaningful to community safety you could potentially be cited for those, those violations. So short story is we're about to convene the next larger stakeholders meeting in the next few weeks to talk about that, that first step of identifying that list of things that we can stop doing in-person enforcement for. And then there's gonna be ongoing work to keep looking at um, the offenses that do impact public safety is there a way that you can use engineering to make things more safe and not have enforcement? Is there, you know, some other enforcement mechanism? Do we just need to revisit what we think is important for traffic and refine that so that, you know, you guys are using your time more efficiently. Uh, nobody's being put into situations where they feel unsafe. You know, there's, there's theoretically reduction in community harm. And uh, so we're, we're looking for long-term to make those kinds of improvements, but in the short term to identify and either deprioritize or stop in-person traffic stops for certain events. I, that was a really long answer and I hope I answered your question. The, the thing that I'd like to add is, are there police officers, frontline police officers involved in the, in the process? Frontline, uh, we, have, we have an assistant, we had two assistant chiefs at the first stakeholders meeting. We had Sergeant, from North Precinct, um, uh, happy to have have first line officers there. So, um, if you want to connect with me, um, so, I think it's always good to have that kind of, you know, representation. Yes, ma'am. So. And the reason why I ask is because I, I, sergeants are great, chiefs are great, assistant chiefs are great. That's wonderful. They don't make traffic stops, and they haven't made tra traffic stops in years. So. Uh, there's a change in the, what happens is uh, traffic goes in waves. There are certain things that occur that haven't occurred 10 years ago. Uh, so, so you need a frontline officer to be there to add into that. They're the guys who make the traffic stops. Um, also, with your engineering of streets and things of that nature. Now we had Rainier in the valley go down to two lanes. Yes. Um, we also have light rail on ML King. We cannot get emergency vehicles up and down these streets fast enough to get to emergency situations because of those changes. And I only ask that a, a, a frontline officer be involved in that because they're the guys who do emergency driving uh, day to day. 
and they know how difficult it is to get up and down to get to a call fast or if you need to get to an officer fast because he needs help. You need to get to a citizen. You need to get to a shooting, something of an emergency. You can't get there because of the traffic. So we need to be careful about the engineering. Add the police in. Add the frontline police officer in so he can give you insight into what uh, he encounters during the day. And then that includes the traffic stop. It's important. Please do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Officer Mullins, am I hearing you volunteering to help us out and become part of our stakeholder group? That would be great. Um, contact me offline and we can figure out who. We also have Captain O'Donnell from the traffic division who is part of the work group. So, you know, um, theoretically, his folks are making traffic stops, but your point is well taken. And I do greatly appreciate line level input in these processes. So uh, let, let's talk. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Great. Thank you both. We have one last update um, on this agenda item. Is there any representative from the Seattle Police Department to provide an update? Good morning. Hi, I'm Captain Davis from the Seattle Police Department. Obviously, good morning, everybody. Um, I think uh, Mark hit all of the good highlights uh, associated with the SPD. However, um, SPD is still under phase three staffing, and we're at uh, critical deployment right now, um, making sure that we field all of our uh, normal assets and try to cover all of our 911 uh, calls for service. Uh, that being said, we're still a shrinking uh, workforce. Um, daily, weekly, we still have individuals walking out of the door. So uh, we expect that to, to happen um, in case something uh, happens to, to the, uh, the positive uh, as far as recruiting, as far as retention, as far as some of those other uh, items that we've already spoke about this morning. Um, other than that, uh, we still are charged and tasked with uh, our community outreach and our engagement efforts uh, while dealing with uh, what we have as far as deficiencies in our staffing. So uh, any information that we can probably get uh, any collaboration that we can probably gain from uh, you know the community um, and going toward that uh, positive direction for SPD would be greatly warranted and appreciated. Thank you, Captain Davis. Uh, Douglas, I saw you. Your hand was up. Uh, just yeah, really quick, um, Officer Davis, um, could you just explain what Phase Three staffing is? Because um, I, I don't I don't know that term. Yeah, basically what it is, it's uh, we have different tiers of staffing in which we use. And phase three is, is when we're pretty much at critical staffing levels. And what that does, that takes uh, every available asset that we have with SPD and make sure that we can use those assets to fill 911 resources. And i.e. detectives uh, that would not normally go out and handle 911 calls, they are 911 ready. Um, to be deployed should we have those type of deficiencies in our regular 911 forces. Thank you. And Malik, I see your hand is up. I would just offer um, connecting to, to what Captain Davis said. And the result of that is, is detectives aren't working on investigations that many residents are seeking resolution on. That's the impact. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I see that concludes our um, department updates. And I'll now pass it to Douglas for the CPC updates. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and I'll see if I can keep the co-chair updates um, as brief as possible. Um, so, uh, a quarterly report from the city was sent to Judge Robart um, regarding the consent decree, I believe. Um, and I think that was shared yesterday and um, we need to share it with the full commission. I think we, we intended to do that for this meeting, but it just wasn't part of the materials. So um, that will go out to the full commission um, after this meeting or as soon as possible um, for your review. Um, on bylaw revisions, we were kind of struggling to find folks to um, chair uh, ad hoc work group to, to review our bylaws. And so we're um, 
taking a different direction, uh, at least thinking about it in terms of um, asking each commissioner to review the bylaws and then email suggestions to the executive director and co-chairs. Um, and then we can compile those and maybe discuss them at a, eventually discuss them at a full CPC meeting, but we might start with our strategy committee who could you know, re take a first uh, review of all the edits that folks have. Uh, and I think we've put out a request to Teresa to just make sure that that process um, is okay. Um, but that's kind of what we're thinking in terms of reviewing the bylaws. So um, I would just say, you know, keep an eye out for emails from the executive director and or co-chairs for um, a potential process of reviewing um, and revising the bylaws that um, we might be able to do um, at least kick off via email. Um, we're making our way through commissioner check-in calls. I know I have a few more to go, so the list isn't full, fully complete, but I have at least like three more to, calls to make. Um, we really want to hear um, how things are going for you on the commission and especially which work groups you want to be a part of. So I would just say, um, you know, if you haven't connected with one of us yet, um, please reach out. Um, we'd love to connect with you and check in and hear how you're doing and hear um, what your interest areas are and where you'd like to be involved on the work groups. We, we really, really need commissioners to step up and co-lead um, work groups. Um, you know, that's a critical way that our work moves forward. We have a limited amount of time in these uh, bi-monthly CPC meetings. And so um, we, we, we need your help uh, to step up in, in those work group roles and, and look forward to connecting with you. Um, I'm wondering if folks have had a chance to review SPD's response to the Sentinel event review wave one report. That response was sent out as part of um, last meeting's uh, materials. Um, again, this is the Sentinel event review process that the OIG is leading. Um, they've, the OIG has sent their wave one report to SPD and SPD has now responded. Um, and so if folks have any reactions or thoughts or discussion, um, I'll just pause for a moment and um, let you jump in. Douglas, can someone uh, resend that to me? Um, Randy, I know you have my email outside of the seattle.gov, the anti-racism one. Can you just forward that to me there? I yeah. cannot find it for some reason, I'm sorry. No worries, we'll send it to you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Alina and Brandy. And I have a question. Yeah. yeah I, my question is that I think that uh, my question is has the SPD uh, begun to implement some of those uh, uh, recommendations? Or do we know that? I'd be happy to chime in. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes, they've um, begun implementing a significant uh, portion of things that were recommended. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you can train and policy your way out of what happened last summer. Right. And so I, I think the bigger, uh, for me, of more importance in those recommendations were the things that get at communication with community, about building relationships, about culture, and about the, the primary one for me is a shift in focus of facilitation of speech and you know making things safe and moving away from a management and control style of, of um, you know situations where people in Seattle want to come out and express themselves. And so uh, one of the moves that they're making there and um, I'd be happy to talk to you offline, Reverend Walden. There's a whole first section okay. in there where the chief talks about other things that he's implemented that are going to give officers. Okay those community connection skills, you know, to, to get them kind of with a different mindset going out there and a, and a growth mindset going out there. Um, but also they're standing up a whole uh, group of officers that are, their job is gonna be to engage in dialogue and in connection with community. And um, they're doing, we're doing a lot of work with um, other police departments around the world, the, the uh, Korean National Police Force is going to be coming in December to have conversations with us about what they're doing, 
uh, working with some Scandinavian departments, some departments in the Midlands, uh, United Kingdom. So there's a lot of work going on with our crowd psychology experts and others to, to really work on the communication and community connection piece. But yes, they have um, been, you know, they've embraced the process and they're really embracing the community input and the recommendations. Thank you. I just step away from the chair for one moment because uh, one of the things that Mothers was concerned about is that Seattle didn't seem to have a safety plan. What happens when you have a, 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 a community protest in a, in a residential area? And, uh, and, and so I still, still think that there has to be a, a safety plan. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, what happens if, you know, we have a gas main and something, uh, something else happens up there in, that, in, in a community, uh, in a residential area? Uh, you need to get people out rapidly, like the people in the apartment next door and those kinds of things. So I think that this is what you're doing. The work is good, but I think also it has to have an overarching safety plan of what happens uh, uh, when, when the unthinkable happens or, or people are out in, in their own community protesting instead of being downtown protesting. And I think that that's what has to come out of this also. At the final analysis, something else has to come out also about a citywide safety plan when people decide that they want to be in their own community protesting instead of going downtown. Yeah, for sure. Um, some of that is touched on in the wave two okay. uh, work that we just did. But if you would do me a favor and make sure that you bring that issue to the planning group, because okay. we're getting ready to start identifying events for wave three. And that was the Chaz shop, you know, period where right. a lot of city services became unavailable That's to right. folks and, and, you know, residents were, were kind of left, you know, hanging by the city. Right. So I think that may be an opportunity there to start getting into those issues, if you would uh, okay. bring that I'll up bring so we can, we can work that in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Austin. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, um, uh, Inspector General Judge, I was um, interested. Um, you said at the beginning of your response that we can't train and policy our way out of this, uh, this crisis, but um, I feel like everything you listed sounded like training and policy to me. Um, so I was, I was curious if you could clarify um, sort of what you meant by that statement and kind of what beyond training and policy um, we're, we're looking at. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that those are important components for sure, but I don't think they're the, the complete answer. I think that you have to start doing things that get at, um, at you know, the, the culture issues that, that we've been talking about since, since I got here, frankly. And so some of those are um, instilling in officers a sense of service. And so some of the, the things that the chief is suggesting and that he's implementing is having uh, new officers who are hired do community service work before they ever, you know, go out and start doing policing work so that they build relationships in community and, and come onto the streets with a sense of their role as public servants and as members of the community and, and as people who are, are part and not, not separate from uh, community members. So I, I think those are the pieces, um, the pieces where you begin really uh, really socializing that notion that free speech is is the core of, of whatever we do and um, that their their approach needs to be one of facilitating that and, and, and doing it in a safe way and and you know having dialogue with people and so for I'm just saying for me personally I feel like those are very core issues in never getting to a place that we were in last summer, having having good communication and connection and and um, a willingness to to see each, all of us as human beings and work together, um, I think policy and training are are critical and important. And you know the the way SPD staffs these things is important. So I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm just saying that um, it's not the only way that you you set the city up for success in um, large scale events like that in the future. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Captain Davis, I see your hand is up. Yes, just circling back to the question that uh, Reverend Walden had. Um, I wanna share with you uh, an update of our community engagement outreach efforts. 
Um, it's a litany of things that we basically put together and have trained on and now we're exercising. Some of the projects have been completed. Some are still a work in progress. But these are the uh, exercises that our community has said that is very, very important to them. And I would like to share that with you. That way, that would give you a, a little bit of insight exactly, especially us in this bureau, what we've been working out on behalf of the department. So I'll make sure I get that out to you properly. Okay. That's Thank fantastic. You. Thank you so much. Um, the last co-chair update is uh, just that we've received and we've shared with the full commission the OPA, uh, the final OPA manual. Um, Brandy is asking staff to review which of our recommendations were included and which were. Um, and so at a future, you know, CPC meeting, we'll have a chance to discuss as a full commission um, where, you know, what our recommendations, where our, our recommendations landed. Um, and we can bring that discussion to the community, uh, community engagement meeting in the future as well. Um, executive director updates. Thank you, Douglas. Um, so thanks commission, commissioners, and for those that are attending um, and joining us. A um, Couple things to note, and then I have a couple of um, budget related um, asks. So um, the quarterly report that was referenced that went to, um, our, to the judge, um, all of that information was sent to everybody Friday evening, um, compiled um, everything that was submitted to the court. So if anyone did not receive it, please let me know, but I sent it out um, just so everyone could be in the loop and see um, what the city had filed and the reports that were shared. Um, also to, um, from a operational standpoint, a few things that are coming down the pipeline. I had mentioned that our office space um, that we have um, is, um, I just did the bid summary, just signed off on everything for work to resume on the CPC's new office space, which I believe is going to start, um, start um, in January, 2022. There are several office spaces and things that were put on pause because of COVID um, and um, looking forward to that new space and having commissioners come and visit when everyone uh, returns. Also, um, I Civic Clerk Plus, during my interim process, I had talked to you all about an electronic board management system. The staff and I are currently being trained on a um, the board management system that was built specifically for the commission. Um, and we're going through administrative training for it now. And so we're hoping to be able to launch that in 2022, I'm really excited for what that will look like. Um, like I had mentioned before, it's electronic voting, it's being able to share things specifically to city departments, it's um, being able to coordinate and engage, um, most like a lot of city government officials do in other states. It just would make us very much more streamlined and how we're putting information out, not only to the public, but to our partners as well. Um, wanted to um, also let you all know that there is um, work being done on the CE side for us to begin planning what the next meetings, events, topics, and special um, guests will be for the end of the year and also going into 2022. Um, our community engagement director, Felicia Cross, has been setting up intermittent meetings with for me um, with representatives um, so we can start thinking about what some of our particular priorities could be for building yet again another independent state legislative agenda. So hoping that once um, we get assignments made, full assignments and um, attendance for um, the amazing staff to be able to relaunch the state legislative agenda work group, that we will have a lot of participation. Um, and I had a few more things, but the two most important that are coming up um, quite fast are there are a couple, there's one training opportunity, um, a DEI training for staff, um, something that I believe would be really helpful for us around improving engagement, unconscious bias, um, just inclusivity within the office space. Um, there has been uh, dollars that have already been allocated um, for us for organizational development and training. And I believe this would be a really great opportunity for not only myself, but the um, amazing folks that I work with um, to be able to have this DEI certification. There was a lot of research that went into this um, from staff uh, to present this. And I just thought it was a really wonderful idea. It's something we have been toying around with for a while, but wanted to bring it to the commission because of the cost that is associated with it. I would want everyone um, to be trained that is currently on staff. And so I just need a, a yay or a nay if I'm able to move forward with that. That's one thing, the DEI training certification for staff. And then um, we have 
um, historically always participated in NAPOL, which is the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Um, we have presented in the past, we have participated um, and came back and presented to the commission about networking opportunities, opportunities to um, investigate and research and sometimes even come back and provide um, a way to um, expand some of the work that we were already doing or considering. I'm coming to the commission again. Um, whenever there is a possibility for a large purchase, I always want to be really transparent um, and include you all. Um, but this is also opportunity to get an okay from you all and then also open the door for folks who would be interested in attending. This would be face to face. It is December 12th through the 16th in Tucson, Arizona. That is um, a Sunday through a Thursday. There are two meetings that would technically still play, take place um, while, um, uh, while attending this and we would um, continue to host those meetings and troubleshoot and do our administrative work remotely as we are currently doing in the current setting that we're in. So I guess, yeah, two asks, Nicole, uh, commissioners that might be interested. And then if we are able to, yay or nay, be able to proceed with making sure um, that staff um, is able to attend that and co-chairs. Um, it again, historically has been something that new co-chairs, co-chairs in general and staff have attended and occasionally commissioners. And so I just wanna open the floor um, to see if there's any hesitation about me pursuing uh, both of those. And any questions, concerns, or comments? I'll step away from the chair and say I think it's a good idea for the training. I mean, because uh, <clears throat> it's it's always excellence when the the increase of excellence that when people when uh, staff members can go and get training and and the excitement that they come back for their jobs and. And then they make new connections and you know new people around the country and that kind of stuff. So I think it's a good idea uh, for uh, for the staff to get that uh, uh, to get that kind of training. It's something that uh, has been on the table for a while, and I'm glad that uh, you, Director uh, 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 Brandy, uh, can uh, bring in this forward. So as I step away from the chair, I would uh, you know I like to speak in positive uh, in favor of this. Uh, 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 thank you. Oh, I was on mute. Thank you, Reverend Walden. Um, I see Captain Davis's hand, but I'm not sure if that was from uh, the previous department updates. That was previous. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm also supportive of um, both in the National Civilian Oversight uh, Conference, uh, commissioners attending, staff attending. I think the diversity, equity, inclusion training sounds great and well aligned with our mission as well. And, you know, Brandy's sharing that it's, um, fits comfortably within our budget. So um, if there's not any questions, concerns, or other comments, um, I would um, recommend that someone make a, a motion to support um, um, th these two requests that um, Brandy's made, both the conference and the, and the DEI training. This is Alina. I'll make a motion um, to approve both of those items. Or do I have to approve them? Do we have to do separate motions? I don't see why we couldn't just bundle them, but yeah. Okay, I'll set forth the motion to approve this. Suzette, I'll second. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, um, and I will just, uh, uh, I'm really excited about this and I'll just say, uh, um, please reach out to Brandy co-chairs um, if you are interested in um, being involved in these opportunities, um, going to the, it, it, whether in person or virtually, but in person would be particularly cool to go to this um, National Civilian Law Enforcement Oversight uh, Conference. There's gonna be a ton of networking opportunities, opportunities to learn about tools and tactics and strategies of our counterparts across the country and kind of sharpen our skills. So encourage you to um, get involved in those. Um, 
And then Douglas, I have one yeah. more, it's okay, just one more update. Um, for the November 9th um, community engagement meeting, just want to encourage everyone uh, to attend. We have um, Dr. Hill Scott from Seattle University who's gonna be coming and talking about the seventh annual public safety survey um, that they have already administered that kicked off October 15th and will conclude on November 30th. Um, Felicia and I have met with um, and been working with them to carve out some space for her and her research team to just talk about the extensive reach out that they've done, the purpose of it, um, and also be able to start closing the loop a little bit better to make sure that folks eventually um, have an opportunity to see the results um, and the impact of said uh, information and feedback. So um, we know for a fact that she will be there on November 9th. Um, and so I just encourage as many commissioners as possible um, for you to uh, be able to attend. And for some of your networks outside of the commission, there has been an extensive language access plan um, and materials sourced and put together. Um, so you all can share with your other networks as well too. So thank you. That's all the updates I have for now. Thank you, Brandy. We appreciate hey. you uh, so much. Hey, Douglas. Okay. Oh, hey. When is that meeting on November 9th? Six to eight. Six to eight. Okay. And did that that um can I get the Zoom information for that too? I mean, Sorry. Um Felicia will be sending out all that meeting and getting all that out to you all too. Okay. Yeah. Did just as a follow-up, um, and I don't know if you or Felicia can maybe speak to this, but I know that did the mantra ever come back for a second kind of presentation for the community engagement meeting or is there a plan like separate meeting right and so we have um talked to uh, dr octelli so it's a two-parter Eilina. and so thank you for asking that um there was a um felicia collected the emails the responses and all of the comments that were made that night and also came uh some after the meeting and we forwarded it we forwarded it to the monitor um and he is going to respond in writing and then yes there is a tentative um uh, date for him to come back. We're thinking about December um, for him to be able to respond to folks and give people an opportunity to ask any more questions. But yes, our game plan, and I will say Felicia's definitely game plan um, and priority has always been and will be to close the loop anytime we're having folks come out and speak and provide any type of impact, input or feedback and um, giving folks an opportunity to be able to um, uh, conclude conversations. So yes, that is being tentatively planned. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was actually speaking to, and thank you for that. That um, That's really helpful to know. Uh, just some folks that weren't able to attend that first meeting, but really wanted to be there. Because um, I think that they were also commenting on mm -hmm. city council uh, on the budget mm -hmm. for policing. So they wanted to be there too. So just wanted to make sure that some folks that had expressed like, hey, can we do this on a different day? Or can we have an additional meeting where we're also being looped into like, hey, here's some more opportunities. Now that we have those those folks email of like, hey, we want to be involved just to make sure we're following up with them as well. Elena, can you follow up with Felicia and connect with them um, so we can make sure that if nothing else, they definitely get invited to that second meeting? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, on new CPC business, the only thing I have in my notes is uh, talking about our strategic planning sessions. So I'll say that they've been really tough uh, and they're going well. Um, so we're like talking about uh, where we're having challenges as a CPC, you know, where we're feeling stuck, um, how we might make a plan to get kind of unstuck. Um, and there's some really exciting discussion about a new direction and the folks from connected realities have been great uh we've had nine hours worth of strategic planning so far it's been a lot uh in over three sessions and we have three more to go so um you know if you're someone who has interest energy in helping us make that plan to kind of get unstuck and pivot in a new a new direction um these are great opportunities for you to be involved in um, where we go from here. Um, our next meeting is on the 9th at 3 p.m. Um, and then the last two, at least for now, that are planned are on the 15th and 16th. Um, so those are both, all three of those are happening over the next um, two weeks and really, really encourage um, anyone who can carve out the time. And I know it's a big commitment uh, to get involved. It's um, 
they've been like I said they've been hard I'm not gonna lie but they're I think that they're going well and I, I like feel less kind of getting unstuck um so it's exciting um work group updates uh behavioral health work group Douglas. Um, so in the behavioral health work groups meeting last week, which is on the, the fourth Wednesday of each month, we had members from SPD come um, for a discussion. We had uh, Sergeant Michael Renner from the wellness unit and Sergeant Williams from the crisis response unit. Um, we had a great discussion about the work that they're doing, uh, some of the challenges they're facing and questions that commissioners had. And we are working with um, community engagement. So a huge thank you to Felicia and Mia on staff um, for, for organizing um, this upcoming event, it will be a public discussion around CIT, the crisis response teams, and the CAHOOTS model, um, and this will be offered for, for community members. So I believe those are all the updates I have. Uh, Dr. Pinto, do you have anything you'd like to add? Okay. All right, thank you, behavioral health team. Um, police practices work group. Thanks, I'm happy to uh, start. And Austin, if I um, miss something, please feel free to jump in. Um, first, I wanna let the commission know that Austin is stepping away from the police practices work group and will be working with the state legislative agenda uh, work group. And so we are down to uh, one co lead. Um, but I'm sure that someone will step up very soon. Um, we are still drafting the letter in support of the residents of the Sunshine Electric Apartments. We received additional information from Daniel uh, Ketchum in emails that he initially sent to SPD asking about tactics and, and chemicals. And so that will be included in, in letters. Uh, we're also going to rework the letter regarding uh, the current use of force policy being used by SPD. And our new letter will not focus on our recommendations that were not accepted, um, but on the fact that if SPD does not hold officers accountable for their actions and the violation of current policies, uh, then the policies have, have no teeth and, and do not matter. Um, lastly, we'll be looking at uh, management action recommendation report that comes out of OPA and deciding what course of action is best for us to take as we review the MARS. So that's that's my report, Austin. Um, something, anything to add? Uh, no, Reverend Hunter, that was uh, that was very thorough. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll just say that. Um, People should be lining up to co-chair police practices because working with Reverend Hunter has been uh, a real pleasure. And um, yeah, everybody should be jumping at the opportunity. Oh, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. I also agree, here, here. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, yeah, I mean, it's, so it's like, it's a jump ball, right? I mean, if you want to get involved in police practices, if you're interested in co-leading it, email brandy co-chairs um you know we don't need to wait to for us to try to reach out and find someone if you're interested reach out and let's figure out a way to get you plugged in um community engagement uh work group good morning everyone um actually i don't have very much more to add uh brandy i think she covered um most of the information and I just look forward to seeing as many of you starting to participate as possible. I think we're on, on to something good here. I do too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. State legislative agenda. Um, I can speak on oh, it. Oh, sorry, so. sorry. I, I was I was messing with my, um, my microphone. Um, yeah, we are. We, uh, Nia and I have been exchanging some emails, looking at, um, you know, just uh, get, she's been very helpful in getting me up to speed with last year's legislative agenda, and um, we're also trying to get a better idea right now of um, bills that are actually going to be put forward um, this session. See what legislators are uh, are working on, um, and so uh, once we have a better idea of that, you know, our 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 goal would be to of course create a a list of um, 
of bills to support um, that we would bring to the full commission for um, for approval. Um, and so we're just looking right now at, at trying to get in contact more with legislators and advocacy organizations, see what they're going to be pushing and, and what the, uh, the ecosystem is going to look like. Uh, and, and Nia has been uh, extraordinarily helpful. I know she's got a lot on her plate. She's been really helpful at, uh, at um, yeah, at, at educating me on all of this. Nia, do you have anything you want to add? Um, not really. Austin really covered everything that we've been going over. And I do want to, since I was given the opportunity to take the time to plug the state legislative agenda work group. Um, we, I had a good time last year. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but um, we had a good time in putting together these statements and being involved in the legislative session. So I invite any commissioners who are interested to um, join us in uh, doing this work. It was really um, fulfilling last year. So that's it. Yeah, it really was. Um, do we have a standing time yet of when those meetings are happening? We do not. So um, my thought initially was to wait until we had another co-lead, but we can move forward if we think that that may take a little bit. Um, you all, one of my outreach calls, just to, um, since we're talking about state legislative agenda and co-leads, um, Esther has expressed an interest in potentially um, helping with um, state legislative agenda. I got to talk to them yesterday evening, but I also don't want to speak out of turn. But Nia, um, I um, said that we could possibly follow up and just give her some updates. But I explained that there hadn't been like a date set or time or anything like that yet. Just the fact that we needed to get up and going within the next couple of weeks, um, sooner rather than later. Um, and, but they seemed really eager to participate and find out more. So I wanted to just add that here. Sounds good. I can reach out to Esther and follow up. Thank you. Great news. Um, great. Uh, lastly, complaint and appeals. I don't know, Erica, maybe Erica Newman or um, someone from the policy team. Hi, I can give the update. Um, it's kind of brief. So um, we had an opportunity to meet last Thursday to kind of do our initial prep meeting. Um, for those of you who have, who have been involved in the work groups and those of you who haven't, um, this is where we kind of take time to um, go over what the roles and responsibilities are for work group um, participation and also um, developing our first um, agenda. So the first actual committee meeting for um, complaint appeals will be on December second. Give me one second. I'm really good at giving out the wrong date. Um, Yes, December 2nd. It was initially scheduled for um, the 25th of this month, but that is Thanksgiving, so we pushed it out a week. Um, so those of you who are already in the Complaint and Appeals work group, like as a work group member, you should see those. Um, you should have seen that invitation come back to your inbox. That is an actual meeting that will take place. Um, and we'll just be going over um, some of the basics, like talking about the um, the council bill that gave us the responsibility to do this work and also looking at the financial component that goes along with the work. So that's it. Thank you so much, Nia. Um, okay, uh, next on the agenda is the discussion of a proposal from council member Herbold's office to um, conduct an evaluation of Seattle's new police oversight. Um, system. So OPA, CPC, OIG. Um, this is definitely a discussion. It's an open discussion. We don't necessarily need to choose to take any action at this point. And uh, to date, we haven't taken a position on this proposal. Um, we're interested in learning more about it. Um, but my, so my understanding is um, Council Member Herbold is interested uh, in um, our feedback and her proposal to move forward with um, basically like an audit of how the three accountability um, organizations are working together, um, how, you know, questions around effectiveness and impact. Um, and it's not clear exactly who might do the audit or evaluation. Um, and obviously there's it raises questions for us around like our independence as a independent body um, 
you know, I think it would be important to find the appropriate person to do the evaluation. And I, I certainly have questions about kind of what the interest in the evaluation is, but we wanted to open this up um, to the commission. And I believe there were materials sent um, as part of the um, about this proposal. So um, I'll pause there and see if there are comments, discussion, questions, concerns. Well, I have a concern and not concern is that the CPC actually is a hybrid and it's the only one in the nation that's like this one, I think. And I, I don't understand. I, I'm wondering where's the expertise to look at the uh, to look at how it was set up uh, with uh, and I mean, it's my understanding also that the uh, that the that the the audit would also include the police department, uh, the police, uh, the IG, I'm uh, uh, the Office of Police Accountability and the CPC. So since it since it is a hybrid, uh, and uh, there uh, and we are independent, I'm wondering uh, who that who's in the city is qualified to actually do the do that uh, to do the uh, to to do the audit, uh, you know, and and you know, and, and that kind of thing. So I think I think there's a lot of questions that we ought to be asking uh, on uh, about this. Uh, not saying that we don't we don't need to. You know, to look at the ways that we can improve and those kinds of things, uh, and uh, so so I'm not I'm not saying that I'm just saying that who's qualified to do that since it's since it's so different and where are the expertise in the city to do that and has they ever done this before? Yeah, Austin. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely think that those questions make sense. Um, I think in general, um, it it also makes sense to me to have somebody do a systemic look at um, at this entire police accountability system um, you know all the the way that OIG OPA and CPC work together the way that they work with the police department and with the city council and with the mayor's office um, I think that we've uh, we as a city have created a really uh, confusing system um, that uh, and, and I think that nobody, has really had the time because every because changes happen so quickly to really take a step back and and look at how this entire system functions and how the pieces fit together. So um, I definitely share Reverend Walden's concern about who might be competent to do that. Um, and I think you know selection of the auditor, like Douglas said, is going to be pretty critical. Um, I would uh, I believe in the materials it was mentioned that the city auditor's office might be up for it. Um, we could potentially look at the, uh, the state auditor too. That could be um, um, something we could look at because uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a city organization that conducts um, the audit. I think it's worth exploring, like Reverend Walden said, who has the, the competence and the expertise um, and the, you know, the independence to, to do something like this. But in general, I do think that we need a, we just need a roadmap or how this thing works, because um, I, I don't think I don't think anybody knows, um, and that's not, of course, like an attack on any specific person or group of people. This these policies are always very complicated, and it's worth taking a step back to try to map it out. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Um, you know, we definitely need to reach out to council member for Bold's office to get more information um, about these, ab about this. So if you have additional, you know, questions, we can bring those forward and then bring that back to the commission. Okay. Um, we can move forward <clears throat> to the next section and on this potential evaluation or audit, you know, we'll bring forward the our questions and concerns around who's going to be doing the audit. I think the having like a state state auditor out, you know, not from the city makes sense to me. Um, and uh, so we can bring what we've heard here today uh, back to Council Member Herbold's office. Um, I think one of the main questions to ask is, what does independence mean? I mean, and, and how does that how does that operate? 
under the city's I I I stat you know under under the city's uh you know what what just exactly what does it mean and also look at the city because I don't think the city had to set up an agency in years. And so it means that if there's an audit, it ought to be an audit at the city on how they set up a new agency and uh, and, and, and things that might've been missed uh, when they set this, the CPC up. I mean, I, I mean, we got statue and it was under, you know, the, the judge signed off on it. The ordinance set us up, but there was no roadmap in order from the city to actually have set up the CPC and the office and the things that should have been done. And so also the IG office was set up also under this. So it seems to me that the audit ought to go both ways because they made, you know, I mean, we were left, you know, I mean, there, there are some things that the city should have done, uh, you know, would have made things easier for us. Uh, and when was the last time they set up any new agencies uh, in the city? Uh, and what does their roadmap look like in doing that? That makes sense to me too. Uh, Austin, is you, do you have a new hand or is it just an old hand? Oh no, sorry, I forgot to lower it. But I, I totally agree with Reverend Walden. I, I mean, yeah, any audit should look at um, everything. Um, it should definitely be, the, the, the whole process should be evaluated, uh, including the city's actions. I totally agree with that. Great, all right, thanks everyone. Yes, yeah. um, um, so just an overview of some of the letters that have come out of the CPC recently or are coming out. Um, Catherine gave an update at the beginning of the meeting on um, the OIG investigation. Um, so uh, just to recap, uh, you know, we reached out to the Office of Ethics and Elections as well as Human Resources. Um, they shared with us what, what they've shared publicly, which is that uh, the, um, the concerns that were brought to them did not rise to a level of an investigation. And so they didn't do an investigation um, because they didn't see um, the need to do one. Um, so we followed up with letters to both the OIG and the OPA. Uh, which were shared with the full commission to get even to ask further questions, get even more detail. Um, and so those those have gone out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Catherine, do you want to give an update on the Terry Caber letter? Sure. Thanks, Douglas. Um, so we sent one letter to both SPD and OPA in response to reviewing the Terry Caber um, case, the MAR. Um, and we requested that SPD and OPA involve CPC with updates to the training for officers um, responding to people with knives, as was a part of OPA's recommendations uh, uh, in reviewing this case. And we also asked to be included in all policy and training reviews and revisions moving forward as related to this case, um, as well as generally. And I think that's all I have um, for update on that letter. Inspector General Judge. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it was in February, maybe after the shooting on the waterfront, I sent a letter to the chief about responding to people in crisis. And that was sort of the genesis of the work that we began doing in late spring. So I'd be happy to share that with you as well, just for your information, if you're interested. Yeah, we definitely would be. I'd love to see that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. Um, Ron? Ron, was your hand up or was that just a quick? I apologize, that was a mistake. Oh, no worries, <laughs> no worries at all. Um, all righty, uh, so we can move forward to the MAR response. Um, Shailene, do you have a update to, that we can you can share? Hi, yeah, sorry about that. So the MAR response is um, similar to the Terry Caber letter that went out. Um, and I think Catherine and I talked about this. So within that letter, it is in response to the MAR that was issued discussing training. Um, so apologies for that. So one of the same, what is exciting that's going to become coming out of behavioral health will be um, a MAR op-ed, something that everyone looked at when they showed their work plan for this work group. And so that's something to look forward to. 
Um, and it just, I think, gives people an idea, the letter that was sent out in regards to Terry Caver, where we're going to be headed as a commission as we start taking a look at the MARS that come out of OPA and other resulting recommendations from all the accountability bodies. Um, and so that op-ed will be a really good, good example and next step for us to really step into the space and announcing that we will be taking a look at this. We are moving forward um, and we are an active participant at the table when it comes to police reform. So that's really what that is, is just kind of giving the commissioners an overview and, uh, and anticipated what's next and next steps. Thank you, Shaleen. Um, so that's all the updates on letters that are coming out, have come out of the CPC. Um, and so, yeah, we were behind the schedule and now we're ahead of schedule. Um, so I can just uh, turn it over to Brandy now for the meeting wrap up. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you everyone um, for joining us today. I appreciate the robust conversation as usual. Um, and uh, look to your inboxes. I've already sent a few things. That was the reason why I got off camera. Um, I hope you all have a splendid rest of your day and an equally better week. Um, and we will be seeing everyone soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Recording.